World leaders left frustrated at the G20 summit as Donald Trump stands by his decision to take the U.S. out of the climate change agreement while they move on without him. It leaves Washington now further isolated on global issues. But does the world still need America for leadership and who will fill the void? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. It is being called the G19 plus one, the one being the United States. This year's G20 summit of the world's major economies was a tense and sometimes frustrating get together, exposing America's isolation on the key issues of climate and trade. The world leaders deplored President Trump for pulling out of the landmark Paris Accord, reaffirming their commitment to fight global warming without the US. It's now left in what some are calling a club of one. Can the world continue to look to Washington for leadership? And if not, who will step up into that role? We will put that to our guests in a moment. But first, our Washington editor, James Bays, has more from Hamburg. Vladimir Putin's meeting with Donald Trump was in many ways the most important diplomatic moment of this summit. He's now given his account of what happened during this two and a quarter hour face to face encounter with only their two foreign ministers and two interpreters present. I don't know how this sounds, but the way I see Trump on TV is very different from the real person. He's absolutely straightforward. He perceives the interviewer in an adequate manner, analyzes and answers the questions quite quickly. I think if we continue in the same manner in which our conversation went yesterday, then there are grounds to suggest that we will be able to at least partially restore the level of cooperation which we need. The U.S. intelligence agencies conclude that Putin ordered the hacking of the U.S. election campaign last year. The president again strongly denied this. He was asked exactly what was said in his meeting with Trump about the allegation. Our position is known. There are no grounds for saying Russia interfered in the U.S. election. Putin may have spoken about their meeting. President Trump did not. He boarded Air Force One, where during the flight, the small group of traveling reporters were then briefed. This has been a difficult summit for the U.S. leader. On two main issues, he was the odd one out on climate and on global trade. Away from the cameras and behind closed doors, there had been very tough negotiations on the exact wording of the final communique. They agreed on a document that lays out their disagreement, particularly on the Paris Climate Accord. One central focus was climate and energy, and here it became clear what I had said ahead of the summit. Where there is no consensus, the disaccord must be mentioned. That's why there is the American position on the one hand. As you know, the United States has unfortunately left the Climate Accord, or rather, they expressed the intention to do so. It was clear at this summit that other countries are struggling to get used to a very different U.S. administration, one with policies which are a break with the past, led by a president who puts great reliance on personal relationships. An example of that came during one of the closed meetings when the world leaders were discussing migration. President Trump needed to leave the room, his place to be taken by a senior aide. But it was not his Secretary of State or his National Security Advisor. A Russian diplomat took a photo of the person who replaced him. It was his own daughter Ivanka, surrounded by the other leaders. James Bays, Al Jazeera, Hamburg. Our world leaders, including British Prime Minister Theresa May, had hoped to use the summit to persuade the US to stay with the climate deal. Like other world leaders here, I'm dismayed at the US decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement, and I've urged President Trump to rejoin the Paris Agreement. The UK's own commitment to the Paris Agreement and tackling global climate change is as strong as ever. Our French President Emmanuel Macron will now host another climate summit in December to push the agreement forward. Sur le sujet du climat, 
On the matter of climate, I think 19 of us restated our commitment and 20 of us noted that the United States has chosen not to remain in the Paris Agreement. And I would like to congratulate Chancellor Merkel on not limiting the declaration to 19. We have a declaration assigned by all 20 members, but I believe it's a mistake for the Americans not to remain in the Paris Agreement. I've said it before and I will say it again. In no case will this American decision prompt any type of backstepping for the signatories to the agreement. Well, Trump did win a concession on another sticking point, trade. G20 ministers failed to renew a long-standing pledge to bolster free trade, dropping their anti-protectionist commitment. Trump has aggressively pursued a nationalistic America first policy, warning of penalties for companies manufacturing their products abroad and criticizing relationships where countries sell more to the U.S. than they buy. Trump pulled out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, covering 40 percent of the world's economy. He'd also threatened to quit the North American Free Trade Agreement. Hostilities over Trump's isolationist policies were seen as a driving force behind the world's biggest free trade deal between the European Union and Japan, finalized on the eve of the summit. Another issue is steel. Trump has threatened a 20 percent import tax that could affect a number of G20 countries, including China, Germany, and Canada. Despite disagreements over the trade barriers, the final summit text included, for the first time, the right of countries to protect their markets with, quote, legitimate trade defense instruments. So let's bring in our guest now. Joining us from Brussels, we have Mark Pierini. He is a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe and a former EU ambassador to Turkey and Syria. In Washington, D.C., Molly McHugh, a foreign policy expert and strategy consultant. And in London, Indajit Palmer, professor in international politics at City University uh, London. Uh, good to have you all with us. So, Mark Pirini, let me, let me start with you then. Um, is this further evidence, particularly on the issue of climate change, uh, uh, of U.S. isolationism, and should we be surprised by it? Well, we're not surprised in the sense that uh, President Trump was elected on a ticket that said America first, and he keeps repeating that just about every day. So the priority is what he thinks is good for America, and therefore it has consequences on international trade and on the Paris Agreement on climate change. Uh, it is not surprising. It has the backing of a very substantial proportion of the American people. It is not sure. It is in the long-term interest of the United States. But for the moment, that's what it is. So what you've seen in Hamburg is not a surprise, uh, but a, the beginning of a reaction of the rest of the international community, starting with the European Union. Molly McHugh, um, I mean, presumably a, a, a lot of what Trump uh, said and did is, is going to go down well with his core supporters back uh, in the U.S., those who, who supported this uh, uh, kind of nationalist America first uh, doctrine. But um, it, it, how, how is everyone else going to look at this, particularly those who, who, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, value the U.S. place in the world and its, its leadership uh, role um, as the kind of defender of traditional uh, neoliberal values? I think there's been a lot of uh, debate about how to review the president's trip in Europe this week. I think at the G20, you saw the president very much isolated from our traditional allies, uh, sort of roving around on his own. Um, there was a lot of nervousness. Certainly the reviews in the European press, in the Australian press, and other places have been very critical of the president's remarks this week and of his behavior. Um, but I think in the United States, there is a split. Obviously, the Trump supporters are rah-rah, America first. But um, in, in Washington, there is a big divide about how to interpret this week. I think, you know, I'm very much on the side of Trump gave too much to Putin. He empowered the Russian narrative. He made enormous concessions to the Kremlin. Um, and his speech in Warsaw, which some people are reviewing as very presidential and sort of very freedom focused, um, was anything but. I mean, he was talking about civilization and sovereignty and traditional values. These are all topics that the Kremlin has used to sort of realign discussion of, of the modern world toward this idea of a traditional society um, that isn't based on the post-World War II order. So I think there's a lot of concern. I think in D.C. it's going to take some time to sort that out. Um, but uh, I think there's, uh, seeing what has happened today uh, as Secretary Tillerson is visiting Ukraine, um, I think we don't really understand yet the extent of the agreement that was made with Russia. And we're going to have a lot of um, probably unpleasant surprises in the next few weeks. 
Indra G. Palmer, what's your take on this? And this was kind of dismissively uh, referred to as a G1 mm. versus, giant, versus G19. Is that fair, do you think? Well, I think to some extent there, there is something to it. But on the other hand, it seems to me that President Trump uh, has a particular style which gets a lot of people's backs up. But when you look uh, back at American presidents, say from Ronald Reagan through George W. Bush, a lot of the same kind of criticism was thrown in their direction, that they are for America only, they're upsetting allies, uh, that they take more than they give, and that they are going to damage the international order irre irreversibly. And I think actually a great deal of what President Trump is doing is overlapping with much of what they did. And to some extent, if you like, a lot of the what he's allegedly have given to Putin and so on has to be seen in a broader context. And that is, if you look at the Three Seas Initiative, uh, which is strengthening a group of countries which are right on the Russian border, if you like, that area, uh, and they're going to be buying American arms probably and American uh, energy as well. Uh, and you look at the Article 5 commitment, which uh, Donald, Donald Trump gave for the first time, uh, then you can see that actually what uh, Putin might have got in terms of a diplomatic coup of some form, uh, President Trump is backing up a lot of that with great force. And then in, if you look at other parts of the world, the arms sales to Taiwan, the Japan-South uh, Korea Treaty has been reaffirmed as well. There's more and more American firepower heading in that, that particular region. So I think when we look at uh, the Russian uh, situation in the relationship, you're going to see it in that broader context. And in that broader context, a large part of what President Trump is doing overlaps greatly. His style is different. He's, he's extolling the virtues of hard power, uh, economic competition, and so on. But I don't think he's fundamentally challenging that order. And uh, I think there are other motives which are trying to back him into a particular kind of uh, an image, which I think need interrogation. And Mark Pierini, what, what historical uh, comparisons would you uh, draw from this? I mean, uh, Indiji Palmer made the point there that um, this isn't something entirely new that we've seen from uh, a U.S. president, the comparisons that were made with, with uh, George W. Bush uh, in his, his first few months as, uh, as president back in, in 2000. Uh, so what, what kind of overlaps do you see there? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a personal anecdote. I was in my, my first posting as an EU diplomat was in Washington, D.C. in the 80s, in the Reagan years. And there were a lot of misgivings about President Reagan, a former actor in Hollywood coming to Washington, etc. And these dissipated relatively quickly. And in fact, these were the Reagan presidency was the, the one that saw the largest uh, armament deal with the Soviet Union back then. Uh, so there was initially here in, in Europe, in Brussels, in European capitals, the hope that the campaign narrative of Donald Trump would sort of, in part, dissipate once in power. Uh, but if you look at the impressions people got here in Brussels at the NATO summit on May 25th, and then in Taormina, the G7 summit in the following days, there's not much uh, uh, of that happening. So essentially what uh, Donald Trump is telling his interlocutors is, I am who I am and I will implement what I promised the American people. Inevitably, of course, uh, some of the heavy realities of international life will weigh in. Uh, let's look at North Korea. You can tweet about the North Korean leader, but at one point, if he does uh, continue to launch inter -ballistic, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, something will have to be done with China, without China, with South Korea, with Japan, we will see. But you cannot forever escape a real confrontation when you are the first uh, military power in the world. So I think the jury is still out. There is a lot of uncertainty about what the Donald Trump presidency will be. And I think Uncertainty at this point in time is perhaps more dangerous than the positions on climate change or, or on trade, because there you know what the alternatives are and the counter narrative is being put in place by the EU, by uh, various agreements, EU, Japan on trade, EU, Canada, etc., etc. But on the very big security concerns, we don't know yet what's going on. Molly McHugh, you, you, you talked earlier about. Um... Uh, one of the big stories out of this summit was the uh, the, the Putin uh, Trump uh, meeting and, and who came out on on, on top there. Um, 
if if you go by uh, the, the thinking that uh, the, the, the the U.S. is stepping back here, uh, and 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 Trump is is to blame for much of it, then where where are nations going to look to for? Uh, leadership in the world, if they're going to look to, to countries like Russia and China, which are seen as, as authoritarian, particularly um, in the West, w w what does that mean for the future? Well, uh, that's the question. And, and, you know, that's exactly right what the previous guest said, that the problem is really the uncertainty. And um, I don't think the comparisons to Bush and Reagan are fair. I know in, in the world, many people are skeptical of Republican presidents, no matter who they are, when they show up. But, you know, we had a president who just gave a speech in Poland not mentioning the word democracy. Reagan would never have done that. Bush certainly never did that. Um, I mean, this is really, it's a very stark departure from the past. And both of those presidents, in real terms, understood the power of the U.S. as being at the table, as being a part of the international system, as being able to move allies behind you to empower alliances behind the narrative that we want to advance. Um, and Trump is exactly the opposite. It very much is the G1. It's this, well, we don't want to be there, so we're not going to be there. And that does cede space to countries like Russia and China that have other agendas, um, but not just them, others as well. Um, and who's going to walk into that space? You know, who will succeed in this sort of new battle for, for dominance of, of international agreements and accords is a really interesting question. You know, I think a, a fair criticism of the G20 summit um, I think everybody was waiting for President Trump, because he's been talking so much about North Korea, to come with a proposal, you know, at the very least some sort of draft communique everybody can sign on to about North Korea and what needs to happen, because it's an opportunity to put pressure on the Chinese and the Russians who are helping North Korea with their programs. Um, at least pressure them to have to sign on, to have to make agreements, to have to say, yes, this is something we need to work on. And that didn't happen. I mean, he was just sort of there to sit and meet Putin, but there was no leadership from the U.S. at the G20 at all. And that's really stark. It's a very stark departure from the past. In the G. Palmer, if, 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 if this is a, a, a kind of real leadership vacuum from the U.S., do you see China and Russia stepping in to the void here? And is that a good thing? Well, I would challenge the idea that there is a void. I think what there is going on is there is a shift in the world and there are now new powers or re-emerging powers and some which are resurgent, if you like, and there are a whole number of non-state actors as well. And I think we should also recall that there is, within the domestic politics of a large part of the world, including a large, many, many European countries and also the United States, there's a lot of discontent. And the key issue is that there's, there are changes in domestically and internationally. The key issue is how do we deal with them? How is uh, the United States to deal with them? Or how is the world to deal with them? I don't think that China's got a global uh, a hegemonic project. I don't think Russia has a global hegemonic project. They are largely operating pretty much in their own neighborhoods. And it is the United States which has a global project. And I think there has been some discontent about the the way in which that global project has been managed and has been carried out. And it was always on the cards, whether you had Hillary Clinton in the White House uh, or Donald Trump, that there was going to be a kind of much more hardline policy and strategy from the United States. My previous, uh, the previous colleague just spoke about Reagan and Bush talking about democracy and so on. But when you look at what they actually did in the world, uh, I, there was precious little democracy promotion that they actually carried out in their military interventions abroad. And I think we only have to look at the Iraq war, which is often uh, dressed up as a democracy promotion of some form as well, to see what kind of effects that actually had. So I would say that Donald Trump falls very much in line with large numbers of post-war American presidents. I think he's just got a much more brusque, robust, militaristic, unilateral way of dealing with it. And the liberal foreign policy establishment wants to continue in the old way. And Donald Trump doesn't represent all of that. He represents a large part of it, but he represents political groupings which are slightly different, economic groupings which are slightly different. But I don't think his overall goal, goal is that different from any others. He just doesn't do it in quite the style that uh, people are used to. Uh, Mark Pirini, there is this view of Trump as well that he, he gravitates towards leaders who are uh, considered kind of socially conservative, uh, Eurosceptic, nationalist, authoritarian um, type leaders. And, and analysts would say we, we saw more of that uh, from Trump over those few days that he was in Europe, the trip to Poland, 
um, and, and the meeting with Trump as well. Uh, do you think that's a fair criticism? Well, certainly seen from here in, in Brussels, the fact that the first bilateral visit of Donald Trump was Poland, uh, a country where the authorities are under scrutiny from the EU institutions uh, for uh, their, their rule of law uh, type of management, uh, was certainly uh, a surprise. And the, the speech itself was a surprise, not only because there was uh, not a word on democracy, but for many other uh, reasons. Uh, so I, I want to believe that uh, Donald Trump is in line with many other presidents uh, of the United States and certainly Republicans before. But if I judge by my contacts with all my uh, former colleagues in the U.S. State Department, I'm not sure he represents anything uh, like uh, the liberal diplomatic establishment. So there is a shock inside the Beltway, that's for sure. There is a shock in New York City and in the financial circles. Uh, there is a shock all over Europe, I can tell you. And uh, the first experiences that European leaders got with Donald Trump, as I said before, NATO summit and G7 summit, uh, were rather sobering, I can tell you. Uh, people wanted to believe that the campaign was one thing, the narrative in the campaign was excessive, but that was part of this populist style uh, that uh, Donald Trump uh, has. But in fact, uh, there is no substantive di discussions in summits with, with Donald Trump. This is what is slowly, slowly emerging from all these summits. And that is particularly worrying when uh, you have uh, major issues such as Ukraine or Syria, where the US and Russia are the key actors. And I'm not too sure, for example, that what has been agreed in parallel with the G20 summit in Hamburg in Jordan between Russia and the US about a ceasefire in uh, Syria is a good thing at all. Uh, it may just play uh, in Russia's hand, period. Uh, Molly McHugh, just going back to this uh, um, criticism that's, that's been made of Trump, that, that he, he has this affinity for um, authoritarian leaders like President Putin, like uh, 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 Poland's leader uh, Duda, at the expense of, of Western democratic leaders like uh, Emmanuel uh, Macron and, and, and Angela Merkel. What, what do you read into that? Um, I, I think there's something there in terms of personality and, and preference and style. Um, beyond that, it's it's hard to say. I mean, look, the, the speech in Poland, you can read it however you want. It's become a bit like the Bible. Everybody's interpreting it in their own vein. But um, it, it was very clearly written by the sort of nationalist view within the White House, which is sort of embraced by Steve Bannon and Steve Miller. Um, none of this was the internationalist leaning anything. And this is why you don't have discussions at any of these summits. This is why President Trump is not leading anything of substance, because there's no policy. And it doesn't matter what the Secretary of State says when he goes to Ukraine or when he's dealing with the Russians on Syria or Ukraine, because it's not clear that that's the policy. And it's not clear that the president won't then go and undermine that with a tweet or something else. Um, everybody who is working in the administration is on edge about this issue. And it provides so much instability um, in the world and so much instability amongst our allies. Um, I mean, yes, President Trump, and not just in this speech in Poland, but he has previously said, yeah, yeah, Article 5, it's never particularly clear, it's never particularly forthright. And in the speech in Warsaw, what he actually said was, well, our actions will speak for themselves. That's not really a guarantee of Article 5. And in the press conference earlier in the day, uh, he sort of avoided saying that he would make any guarantees of the American troop presence in Poland, which the president of Poland also acknowledged that, that they hadn't agreed on this and they were going to continue to discuss it next year. Um, that's really stark. And uh, there, so there is this big difference. I think people are really on edge. Um, nobody really knows what Trump stands for. And then you have these very concrete agreements with, with Putin about working with them on cybersecurity, which is just nonsense, you know, agreeing not to meddle in each other's affairs, which is just endorsing a Kremlin narrative for a long time that all unrest is ru in Russia is caused by the United States. And then all the right. ceasefire agreement on Syria, which will do very little. It's the same as previous agreements. And on that, we're going to have to leave it. Thank you to all three of you, Mark Pierini, Molly McHugh, and Indajit Palmer. Thanks very much for being on Inside Story. Thank you as well for watching. Remember, you can see this program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, 
That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. We're also on Twitter. You can join the conversation there. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story for me, Hazard Seeker, and the whole team here. Bye for now.